And it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Dr. Lena Meyer Hein, Head of Department Computer Assisted Medical Interventions at the German Cancer Research Center, for a talk on comparative validation of AI algorithms. Professor Dr. Meyer Hein, we are very excited to hear your presentation. Thank you very much. I hope you hear me well. I'm very excited to be here uh, today. It's a really uh, exciting lineup of speakers, actually. Uh, like you said, I'm uh, Lena Meyer Heim from the German Cancer Research Center. And today, uh, I actually want to speak about some of the pitfalls of AI. I'm a trained computer scientist, and I still remember studying back 20 years ago. And it used to be almost embarrassing to say um, that I comp study computer science, especially with an AI focus. Uh, and as you all know, things have changed around entirely. Um, data scientists these days are almost hunted. Uh, and on the one hand, I think this is a great development, of course. On the other hand, uh, I think this comes with some danger. Uh, and one problem is that all of a sudden, people that were never trained for machine learning apply it uh, without uh, maybe being aware of the pitfalls in another problem, I think, is that uh, the machine learning experts uh, apply machine learning in various domains uh, without having sufficient expertise actually in the respective domains. So let me clarify a little bit better what I mean by this. Um, my, my professor, Professor Weibel at university, always used to say, there's no data like more data. And we all know that we need a lot of data um, in machine learning. Um, and data in medicine is sparse. And you can see this particularly well if you look at the COVID-related research. Um, so researchers started basically taking all the data they could possibly get, in this case for uh, diagnosing COVID on the basis of imaging data. And I really like this very recent uh, paper that came out because the authors observed uh, that actually a lot of papers, a lot of authors merged data from infants with pneumonia uh, with data from adult COVID patients. So in other words, and this is not a, not a single example, right? This is a lot of papers in which this uh, occurred. In other words, a machine learning algorithm capable of distinguishing adults from children will have a 100% accuracy if you use just these two data sets. So this is obviously a problem. Now, you may say, well, uh, age is an obvious confounder. That's how we call these hidden variables. Uh, but there's a lot of not so obvious ones. Um, so for example, cables in the images, or even the position in which you take an image can have something to do with the health condition of the patient. So long story short, domain knowledge, from my perspective, uh, matters, and I think Helmholtz did really well recognizing this. So as you may know, Helmholtz is Germany's largest scientific organization uh, looking at grand societal challenges such as climate, such as cancer, for example. And today I'm basically talking on behalf of uh, two initiatives, two large initiatives, HEDA, which also has a really large uh, postgraduate training uh, network um, for the AI part, basically, and HIP uh, for, for the imaging. Personally, I'm a department head uh, at the German Cancer Research Center. Uh, my core research is about improving interventional healthcare, specifically surgery, with data-driven methods. And here also we have a focus on imaging techniques. So to, just to give you one example, um, we work on new imaging techniques such as photoacoustic imaging, where the, the actual data is not human interpretable, but then we use deep learning uh, to convert the data, the high dimensional data into clinically relevant information. So here, for example, you see a phenomenon called spreading depolarization. It's a fast forwarded movie actually, which occurs in patients that have a stroke. However, um, I don't wanna talk about this core research today because uh, I think we, we 
have to talk a bit more about the meta level. So, so what I want to talk about is go, actually goes beyond surgery, beyond imaging even, uh, which is the validation of AI algorithms. Um, so as you know, um, AI algorithms are typically validated in international competitions, so-called challenges, uh, just like you would validate new medication in clinical trials. So in these competitions, uh, um, the participants work on identical data sets, and then a lot of attention is typically given to the winner of such competitions, prize money, uh, fame, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a few years ago, uh, and here I'm talking on behalf actually the Mikai Society uh, and uh, the respective working group, we started asking ourselves, um, is the winner really the best? And uh, this, was, this question was answered in a large consortium. We needed a lot of data. So we actually analyzed five, more than 500 individual competitions. Um, I will not be very comprehensive in this talk because uh, I don't have the time actually. Uh, you can read all the details in the papers that I'm quoting here. But I want to show you uh, with some illustrations what the problems are. So this. This graph, graphic here is now based on a real world challenge, um, a challenge that occurs frequently, is very famous, frequently cited. And you see the, the first ranked algorithms basically. Now, um, you, you do have to make a few decisions in order to rank your algorithm, right? So what you have is basically a set of images, your test images, then uh, you have a reference Annotation, for example, an expert drew the, the outline of a tumor. You have the output of the competing algorithms, and then now you have to decide uh, how to score an algorithm. And the obvious choice you need to make is the metric. Uh, and maybe not that obvious choice is the aggregation method. So you can either first, or for example, you can first rank the algorithms on each image and then aggregate the ranks. Or you can first aggregate um, the metric values and then compute the rank. And then, of course, you can also play around with the aggregation operator. Mean versus median would be an obvious example. So just to illustrate the effect, the effect can be, of course, also depending on uh, the, the size of your da test data set, can be extremely large. And the same holds true for other choices that you, you make. So we, we showed that leaving out a single test data set can change the ranking. Having another expert annotate the challenge data can change the ranking. So you know the ranking is very unstable. So what we did we do? I mean, the first obvious thing to do is to, to report what is being done, to report it in a transparent manner. So we released this this guideline, which is uh, now also accepted as official uh, guideline by the Equator Network. And uh, we set up a MIKAI, the, the largest biomedical imaging society, up in a way that if you organize a challenge, you have to put the full challenge design online before the challenge takes place, similar uh, uh, to how you have to register a clinical trial before you do it. So that's on the reporting uh, side and also to prevent cheating in challenges. Um, the other aspect is the uncertainty that I showed. Um, so this uncertainty is actually, I mean, what I say now is not only uh, true for competitions, but also for, you know, the own personal validation studies that, uh, for example, researchers do. So say you want to compare these five algorithms that you see here then you would probably agree with me that if your algorithm is algorithm one, you would prefer the left-hand raw data where you see basically the box plots uh, of the metric values of the performance scores. But these two plots result in the exact same ranking. And we found that most challenges actually only report a ranking table as main result. So this is clearly not sufficient. So we proposed a toolkit actually for for capturing such uncertainties, you, you see on the left-hand side that algorithm one, even if we introduce noise in the process, we do this via bootstrapping in this case, uh, the algorithm just remains the winner. 
uh, while this is not the case uh, on the right hand side. I mean, this is just a simple example. The framework goes way beyond this and will also be further extended, but it shows, it shows you how uh, we can find possibilities to handle uncertainties. Now I showed you the, the ranking instability also resulting from metric values. So let's talk about metrics. Um, I really like this piece of history uh, uh, from Hanoi where there was a rat plague and to get rid of the rat, uh, people would get a monetary award for handing in rat tails. And what happened, I mean, what was intended of course was that all the rats would be killed. But people actually left the rats alive so that could get more tails and the rats would reproduce and so they could earn more money for the tails. Uh, obviously not attended, but I think um, it's a good example of how a metric fails to measure what is supposed to be measured. And I think we face similar problems in medicine. So uh, let me give you an example. Um, the DSC, the dissimilarity coefficient, which for the experts, by the way, it's very closely related to the IOU, intersection over union, uh, is the most widely used metric in competition. So as you see in this graph on the left-hand side, it was used by more than 400 competitions uh, that we analyzed. And it simply gives you a value between zero and one. So you have a reference contour by an expert. This could be a two more. Blue is the reference contour. Uh, orange is the algorithm output. So you measure basically the overlap and you get a value between zero, no overlap and one full overlap. So I guess this sounds plausible and it is plausible in many cases, but let me show you some of the pitfalls. So the DSC has often been used for detection challenges where you actually want to detect lesions, tumors. And as you see in this example, um, it is not a de good detection uh, metric because uh, if you look at prediction one and two, two competing algorithms, uh, the second one is actually clearly better because it detects all of the three lesions, but it has a much worse DSC score. So not a good metric for this particular problem. Now you may, now you may say, well, this is a detection metric, so let's look at you know, single structures, um, but we have similar problems here. So take a small lesion, and this is, this is a frequent problem in biomedical image analysis. Now here you see that two algorithms actually differ in only a single pixel, but the DSC, the metric value is radically different. I mean, 0.5 to 0.8 on a scale from zero to one is actually a game changer. Um, and I think it's obvious that this shouldn't happen. And it particularly shouldn't happen if you take into account the reliability of the reference annotation. So this is a beautiful paper that showed how different annotators, and you see the different annotators for the different colors actually, um, differ in, in their outlines of the, of the structures of, of the anatomy. And now again, think of that single pixel difference and whether it should be punished in such a way. And the same actually holds true for the AI part. I mean, there's now more and more work coming out on the non-determinism of AI. Um, so some of the things are obvious. I mean, we work with random seeds and such things and the networks, but some of the things are not so obvious. For example, um, the dependency on the GPU and how operations are computed on the GPU, which introduces randomness in the process, such that if you take the exact same training data, you take the exact same architecture, you will get different outputs. So all of these things have to be considered together, machine learning experts together with domain experts. Uh, and this is one of the things that we're currently doing, uh, joining three initiatives, the Mika Society, the MONAI uh, and the BIAS Initiative. And we're working on best practice recommendations now for the metrics. Before I close, uh, one last aspect. So my, my program just told me that PowerPoint stopped working, but I still see this slide. So let's, let's see what happens. Um, something that we haven't answered yet is what we can actually learn from a challenge. So 
I excuse these bloody pictures here. This is uh, in the context of computer assisted surgery where we want to track <coughs> instruments. And um, the question is after performing a challenge, what is working, what is not working, where do we have to improve? And this is currently not answered um, by the competitions. So um, since my program stopped working, um, I will probably try if I can get it restarted. How much more time do I have left? So you still have two minutes. OK. So um, I, I will just quickly go over this. So um, we basically use statistical models to identify sources of error, just to give you one example. Here we found that crossing instruments are a main source of errors, while, for example, overexposure in the images is not a problem. And I think such a statistical analysis, I mean, really combining statistics with machine learning is really powerful to find out how we have to tailor, tailor a future algorithm development to the specific needs. And the final slide is something, yeah, it's tricky, but it's very important, I think, uh, because there's a misconception that the network architecture is key to success. You see in this challenge with the first 100 participants here that actually rank number one, rank number one and rank number 100 actually use the same network architecture. Um, so there's a lot of things that you do in the network design that have a big effect on an algorithm performance. And our new mission now is to find out what makes a winner the best in such competitions. And uh, hopefully I can report about this next year. The main message is that I think currently one of the reasons that the, the, the AI promises do not match what basically happens in clinical practice is the way that we validate algorithms. We're not doing a good enough job there yet. I mentioned some of the reasons there's more of this, but I only have a limited amount of time and I hope we can improve here. Thanks to my team, uh, the collaborators on this and also Helmholtz for funding this via HIP. Thank you, Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Maya Hein. This was a really impressive um, presentation.